right here in 1 Peter chapter number 4. I'm going to focus on the end of the chapter. Begin reading in verse number 16. The Bible says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, so we're talking about Christians, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Referring to Christians again, right? And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not? The gospel of God. Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I'm going to be preaching about the chastisement of Christians, about the judgment of God upon Christians or upon the saved. Now, this is a, an extremely important biblical truth. It actually straightens out uh, a, a question that almost every single person has when you give the gospel. This is the number one reason why it is so important. I believe it's one of the most important truths that you need to understand in the Bible because it explains, number one, the gospel, but it will also, <clears throat> it will also exhort you to live properly, to live correctly, and to live a righteous life. It is an extremely important doctrine in the Bible. Now, I want you to, number one, I want you to read with me verse number 17 again, and I want you to read in your mind just this verse. Just follow along in your mind. And I want you to listen to, to just the majesty of God's Word. From, this verse, number 17, is just an amazing verse. You just hear the power in this verse. Listen again. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The Bible is just an amazing book. There's no book written like the Bible. And do you hear just the power in that particular verse? Just that one verse alone, all the truths that are in it, and he explains the time has come that judgment must, must begin at the house of God. You know when that time is? It's now. That's one of the first points that I want you to understand, I want, I want to make in this sermon is that the judgment of the Christian begins in this life. It begins now. The time has come now for you, Christian, that judgment must begin at the house of God. But then it says this, And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The point is that, yes, we will be punished. We will have chastisement. We will be judged, right? But the judgment that's going to come upon them that obey not the gospel of God is far worse. I want to also make another point early on. A few points that I'm going to make introductory, and I will refer back to these throughout the duration of the sermon. A point that I want to make early on now is the concept that we read there at the end when it says, And if it first begin it up, us, what shall the end be of, of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now look at verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved. There are people that will teach, you know, uh, what would be considered a hyper grace type of teaching, where once you're saved, that's it. You're saved, brother. Well, hey, you are saved as far as going to heaven. You are saved as far as you're never going to hell. There's nothing you can do to go to hell. Eternal security, no matter what. It doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter what you do. But they go so far as to say that God will not even judge you in this life. It doesn't matter the way that you live your life. You can just do whatever you want. And that is false. Right. And the Bible is filled with story after story after story of rebellious Christians being judged by God. Rebellious nations, the house of God of Israel in the Old Testament, is just continually being chastised and rebuked and punished by God. If that is something that someone believes that you know, you need to warn them about that. That's a dangerous teaching. That's another reason why this is so important to get this truth out there to make sure that people understand you will be judged, Christian. The time has come where jud that judgment must begin at the house of God. I want you to turn to John chapter number 1, verse number 12. I want to make some more introductory statements before we get into uh, the sermon, the meat of the sermon if you will, John chapter number 1, verse number 12. The reason why we are judged now of God is because we become a child of God. At the moment that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become his son. You become his child. You are born again into his family. The Bible talks about you must be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. You are born and you become a child of God at that moment. We're all sons of God by faith. Christ Jesus, it says in Galatians. Look at John chapter number 1, verse number 12. But as many as received him, 
So whoever it is, whoever believes, many has received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And then he explains in detail, even to them that believe on his name. That's all you have to do is put all of your faith and all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are immediately a child of God. You are born again into God's family. You are one of his children. All you have to do is trust him. It's that simple. He loves us so much he did all the work and then he offers the gift. And if you receive the gift through faith, you're saved and you're born again. So number one, that shows you also that not everyone is God's child. And that's very important to understand the chastisement of God or the correction of of God. The chastisement of the Christian is for your profit. The punishment of the sinner in hell is not for their profit. It's just justice. That's all that it is. It's not for their profit. It's not for their benefit. It's not for their rehabilitation. They don't get a second chance. God's not trying to help them or correct them or fix them. God is just making things right. The chastisement of the Christian is, is majority for your profit. We're going to get into that again as I said just a moment, let's go to Hebrews chapter number 12. We'll actually look at that now. Hebrews chapter number 12. So we see that the moment that we put our trust in God, we become his child. We put our trust in Jesus Christ, we become a son of God. At this time, God is now obligated to punish us. Just as you have children, you are obligated and you are responsible to punish your children. You love your children and you want them to turn out right. That's the same reason why God punishes us. He's punishing us for our profit. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 5. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. So God speaks unto us as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So we shouldn't despise when God punishes us, nor should we faint or just give up when God punishes us. Why? Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. That's a pretty good, you know, uh, that's a pretty good, you know, comfort in a time of punishment is knowing that God is doing this because he loves you. That's the whole reason why. Don't faint. Why? Because he loves you. That's why he does it in the first place. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Notice, how many sons does he scourge? Every son. Why? Is anyone just going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I just never sin again, brother? Not going to happen. Everybody's going to continue to sin, right? He, you know why he punishes every son? Number one, because he's a good God. Because he cares about all of his children. He doesn't just care more about the Jews that are saved and not the Gentiles that are saved. He cares about all of them. And you know another reason why is because they're all going to sin. We're all going to continue to sin after we're born again. You know, we still have the same flesh. We're born again and we have the Spirit of God living inside of us that's guiding us, that's contributing to helping us live a righteous life, right? But that same flesh is still, all those same lusts, all of that is still there. So you can choose whether you want to walk in the flesh, walk in the Spirit. If you choose to walk in the flesh, God will chastise you. Why? Because He loves you. That's a good thing. Look at verse number 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So what child is there that doesn't receive chastisement from their father? You know, if they don't punish them, that just means they don't love them. That's what that means. This just shows what the Bible's teaching is that God loves you. What son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Chasteneth not? Verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Notice all are partakers. Then he says this. Then are ye bastards. And not sons. So a bastard is someone that does not have a father. Uh, he's saying that if you never receive punishment, if you are never chastised by God, that just shows that you are not saved. If you can just live however you want, if you can just do and commit whatever sin that you want, or perform whatever filthy, lascivious act, and God never rains down on you, then that may, that may mean that you are not saved. If that does happen, that means that you are not saved for sure. You know, you would be a bastard and not a son. There's nothing wrong with the word bastard. You know, people think that they're, you know, that, that, you know, they get this real pious attitude. And they think they're more pure than the, than the pure words of the Bible. You know, this is the, this right here is the standard of purity. You're not purer than this. Amen. This, you know, if this, you know, Bible uses the word, you know, bastard, then the word bastard is pure. If this, if this word, if the word of God uses the word piss then the word piss is pure. And I don't give a crap who that offends. And I'm not kidding. I 
Bible say that? And, and, and you know, obviously, if I had to, you know, work somewhere, they say, "Hey, don't use that kind of language." Language. I don't care what person comes in here and sits in this pews or these seats. We'll get pews maybe someday, right? Because I make that mistake so often. You know, with uh, <clears throat> the church that I grew up in, we had pews all the time. That's why I say it all the time. But uh, you know. If, if, if it, it wouldn't matter to me who came in here. We, we, need, to, we need to you know, make sure that we, we need to teach others. We don't, shouldn't be ashamed of the Bible. That's what I'm saying. Amen. We could use that as an example to say, hey, the Bible uses the word piss. The Bible uses the word bastard. We don't need to become, you know, we don't need to conform to society in ways in which they think that they are more ethical than God. They would look down. If you were to ask most people, is the word bastard bad? They would say yes. Right? Wouldn't they? The majority of people, is the word piss bad? They would say yes. Here's the problem. Even Christians would say yes. Right. Well, what about the King James Bible, how it says that right here? And then they would read that, and while they're reading God's word and they read that verse, how do you think they'd feel? Oh, oh my gosh. They would, really, yeah. wouldn't they? You know what I'm talking about? When you get that feeling, when you know something's wrong, you shouldn't have that state of mind. Right. You need, this is righteousness here. Right? Amen. This right here, these are pure words. Amen. Every word of God is pure. Amen. Now, that's a side note, of course, not the topic of the sermon. Look at verse 9. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh. So fathers in this life. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which directed us, and we gave them reverence. So they gave them. They're saying that they, they revered them, they respected them because they, they, uh, they disciplined them, right? Shall we not much rather be in, be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own Pleasure. Now, I've heard people, you know, like atheists try to abuse this verse and say that they chastened us, you know, for a few days after their own pleasure just to say, like, they enjoyed, you know, beating them. That's not what this is teaching. I don't know if anyone is confused about this verse. It's saying after their own pleasure because if my child, if I want my child to do something, right, and he's, and he's, he's just totally out of control and he's just driving me crazy. You understand what I'm saying? He's just being terrible and he's vexing me, right? And just driving me nuts or something. And I spank him. In five to ten years, what's going to happen if I continually discipline my child? He's going to become a good child, right? After your own pleasure. You know, it doesn't only benefit the child in that case. It benefits you because he, the child benefits you. Children are, are there. The Bible talks about it in Galatians 4. That children are there to serve. That's what children are for. There's nothing wrong with that. When you grow up, then things change. But while you're in my household, you're there to serve. That's your job. And I'll teach you how to do things. You can learn things, but that is your job. You're there to learn and serve. As a child, you are, and when you are a child, you are a servant. Even a child is known by his doings. You are there to work and to do. And that's good for children. And they grow up to be good, you know, even members of society. You know, instead of these lazy, stinking bums where these bunch of kids... You know, run the households, and they grow up, and they have no clue how to do anything. They have no clue how to work. They don't have a good work ethic. I'm glad that my dad forced me to work when I was a child. I'm glad that my dad made me do things that I didn't want to do. And I didn't grow up being a brat and thinking that everything was handed to me. You know? You know, and that's the same type of people that think, you know, that you should just allow your children to run the household. Those are the, the, the same people that would say something to you or trying to figure out how to fix their kid when he's 20 years old and he won't move out of their basement drinking Mountain Dew all day and playing video games. Right. Seriously. <laughs> these stinking millennial retards and stuff. They, yeah. Maybe you should have, you know, it's, and it's sad because it's probably too late because they need to be disciplined while they're young and they need to be taught to work. Right. Children need to be taught to work. Yeah. You need to find things for your children to do, activities as far as working. They need to be busy with their hands and working. That is very important for children. Look at what it says in verse, uh, verse number 10. We'll finish the verse. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. So while God's punishing you, it doesn't seem to be very fun. Right? <clears throat> Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That's exactly what I was just talking about in the, the scenario of one of our children. If we were to discipline our children at that time, it's not going to be fun, is it? But, but afterwards, you'll have, there'll be a good result for that child when he grows up and he understands how to obey authority and he listens to his boss and he knows how to work and things along those lines. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 89. 
Psalm chapter number 89. One of the, the very important things about this doctrine, one of the reasons why this doctrine is so important is because it bolsters or it strengthens the, the doctrine or the teaching of eternal security. Eternal security. A lot of people think when you sin, you lose your salvation. A lot of people think when you sin, you're just no longer saved. But that's not what happens. If you sin and you're saved, you're punished. That actually explains the doctrine of eternal security. You don't lose your salvation. God just punishes you on this earth and in this life. I want you to look at Psalm chapter number 89. Go to Psalm chapter number 89. Psalm chapter number 89. This is a promise that was given to David. And then ultimately, of course, was speaking of Christ. And it's, it's, the, it's in the same line of the promise of the gospel that started with Abraham. It started with Noah. That started with, with Adam. There was more details that came by, you know, as time went on. But it's the same exact problem. It's just the, uh, it's just the gospel. This is the promise of the gospel. I want you to look in Psalm 89, verse 26. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father. My, my God and the rock of my salvation. I want you to notice that he's going to cry and say, My Father. So this is the Son speaking to the Father, right? Notice that. Also, I will make him my firstborn. Notice references to the child, him being a child. Higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. You notice that? My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever. And his thrones... As the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments. If you look in Hebrews chapter number 2, speaking of Jesus, it says, The, the children which thou hast given me. It's Jesus speaking, right? That's what this is talking about. His seed and his children. It's talking about the children of Jesus. What does that make him to us? The Father. Right. Look at verse number uh, 29. Let's read it one more. Or verse 30. Let's read it one more time. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, they will lose their salvation. That's not what it says. No. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. And now look at this. Beautiful words. Comforting words. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Notice that. That loving kindness is a reference back to that mercy that he was speaking about a few verses later. He's saying, my mercy, the grace that God shows to us when we are saved, he will not take from us. God will punish us. He will chastise us for our benefit, for our profit, that we might be a partaker of his holiness if we sin. We do not lose our salvation. We are punished in this life. He will visit our transgressions with the rod. He will punish us in this life. And we're going to go over some punishments that God brings down upon uh, mankind when they sin against them. His children specifically. Then it says in uh, verse 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. God, God will not you know, cause himself to be a liar for your sake. You know, God promised that you have eternal salvation. And there's nothing that's going to happen about that because God already spoke. Amen. God cannot lie. You know, the Bible talks about that. He promised this before the world began. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Amen. It will not change. You're saved forever. It doesn't matter. But you know what? That doesn't mean we're not hyper-gracers. That doesn't mean, hey, live however you want. You're going to heaven and nothing's going to happen. God will visit your transgressions with the rod. God will punish you, and he will punish you severely. And here, But here's the thing about that as well. Even in the midst of those punishments, you shouldn't just give up. You shouldn't just faint. No, you should remember, oh, God is punishing me because he loves me. Amen. It's actually comforting. I'm happy God punishes me. Right. You know why? That means I'm a son. That's well, right. I'm just glad I'm not a bastard. I'm glad I have a Father in Heaven that loves me and wants me to do that which is right. You can at least have that attitude. Amen. At least if you don't want to do that which is right, at least comfort yourself for a few minutes and say, you know what, at least God loves me. At least, I mean, what kind of a father, you know, who, wouldn't you be so much more happy if you had a, a physical father that would at least spank you and care whether you did that which is right? Imagine having a father that just said, just get out of here. I don't care what you do. 
Go do whatever you want. Would that be a good father? No. You wouldn't want a father like that. I'm glad that God loves me. I'm glad that I'll always be his child. There's nothing that can change that. Amen. I'm glad that God punishes us and, and promises that he will punish us because he will never alter that thing. That's what he's explaining right here as well. I want you to understand that. He's saying, I will punish you, but my promise will never change. Even when I punish you, I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He says, nevertheless. So even though, is what he's saying, even though I punish you, I'm not altering. That doesn't mean that my covenant is null and void. My covenant still stands, but I will, I will visit your transgressions with the rod. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 6, verse number 1. I want to look at another passage where this is spoken of, just a quick one. Psalm chapter number 6, verse number 1, while we're here in the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm chapter number 6, verse number 1. This is David speaking. This is the attitude that we should have. This is the fear that we should have of God. O oh Lord, <clears throat> rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O oh Lord, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are back. So, number one, we see that David, the attitude that David had about God was he realized and he knew that God was a God of judgment, that God was a God of punishment, and that he cannot just do and live however he wants. There are consequences with God. He understood that, number one. Number two, we can see that David had a fear of God. Please, Lord, don't, don't punish me in your hot displeasure. Please don't, don't, don't uh, vex me. What does he say? Don't uh, rebuke me in thine anger and chasten me in thy hot displeasure. You know, please just have mercy on me. He knew that God was a God of anger. He knew that God was a God of justice and of punishment. We need to have that attitude of God. We need to have a healthy fear of God. <clears throat> Go to Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3. We get another little nugget from here. Proverbs chapter number 3. I want you to look at verse number 11. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 11. So we see that the teaching of chastisement of the Christian or judgment of the Christian actually explains to us and strengthens or bolsters the teaching of eternal security. That's one of the major points that I want to make tonight. You do not lose your salvation. God punishes you in this life. You will not go to hell. God will chastise you now. On the, ju the judgment is time. The, the, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The time has come now. You know, and it talks about, you know, if, if the righteous scarcely be saved. So are we saved? Yes. You understand the wording there? If the righteous scarcely be saved, we are saved, but just barely. You know why? You're saved from hell, but you're not saved from judgment on this earth. That's why. Because the time has come. That's what he's explaining. It's time to be judged now. Previous to that, you can look this up later. It's very interesting. If you study the, the chapter uh, chapter 4 of 1 Peter, right before that, he's talking about how you know that, that the gospel was preached to all of those that died at the time of Noah's flood, that they may live according to uh, man in the flesh, but but uh, you know die according to God in the spirit. Saying they could have they would have died when the flood came, but they still lived. And they were judged according to men in the flesh, is what it says. They were judged according to men in the flesh, but they lived according to God in the Spirit. These were the uh, speaking of the people that lived at the time of Noah's flood. God judged them according to their flesh. He corrected them, right? And punished them because of the, the sins of their flesh and things like that in this life. But then they lived according to God in the Spirit. The judgment for the Christian happens in this life. They are scarcely saved. They're not saved from hell, but they still receive judgment on this earth. But it says, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Saying the, the end of them, because they're going to hell. The punishment is at the end for that person. Look at Proverbs chapter number 3, <clears throat> verse number 11. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 11. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his corrections. This is actually the quotation from Hebrews where we read before. It says in verse 12, he explains again why. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son. And then it says this, in whom he delighteth. See, notice the love there is speaking of that he delights in you. He loves you. He cares about you. But I want you to look at the, the very next verse. I'll compare this unto un something later on. You'll see that there is a connection here, actually. It says this right after that. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. 
and the man that getteth understanding. You actually learn and you grow, you, you obtain wisdom and you acquire understanding from punishments. You actually can, you know, there, there, are the, there are obviously bad things about being punished because no one enjoys it for the time being, like it says in Hebrews chapter 12. It's never joyous at the time, but you know what? There are many positives of it. Number one, I'm happy that I'm saved. Number, number, number two, I'm happy I'm a son of God. I'm happy that he loves me, right? But not only that, you can learn from it. You can actually learn from your mistakes. It's a good thing and you can grow in wisdom. And you should be happy when you are punished. If you've made a mistake, you need to repent. You should be happy that God punished you. He loves you. Now learn from it. It's a perfect example to learn from. You shouldn't make mistakes. You know, it would be better to learn from others, other people's mistakes. You shouldn't just go out and try to make mistakes so I can learn from them. Oh, you know, you just be real careless. I'm just learning in life, man. That's a bad attitude. All right. But you know what you should do is if you've already made a mistake, learn from it. You can obtain wisdom from that. You know, it, it, you, it does give you experience in the sense that you can learn, hey, I'm never going to do that again, right? I've done things at work before that seemed like a bright idea with a tool or something like that, and I promise you I'll never do that again. There's, I can give you many examples afterwards. That didn't work out the way that I thought it was going to work out, you know? And then I got a bruise or some scratch or something for, for weeks or I'm bleeding, whatever it may be, right? You learn from mistakes. That's another reason why... Punishment is a positive thing. I want you to turn your Bibles, go to Leviticus chapter 26. We're going to read this one quickly. We can see the, the love that God had for the nation of Israel as his people for that particular nation. They were a peculiar people unto him. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. It speaks of him, you know, uh, speaking about punishing them, and he uses the word chastise. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So keep that in mind. If God does chastise you, that means that you are a son of God, right? Look here in uh, Leviticus 26, verse 27. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. That's the God of the Bible. If you walk contrary unto him, he'll walk contrary unto you. You're not going to push him around. He's not a pushover. Amen. Look at what it says next. I, and I, even I, will chastise you. Now watch what he says. Seven times for your sins. And then he goes on and describes some, you know, extremely gruesome punishments that he will bring upon them. And this is, of course, speaking of the nation of Israel turning back to the abominations of the previous nations that in, inhabited the land of Canaan, and which were disgusting, abominable acts, you know, uh, things that are, are horrible even to speak of, right? But God says, you all, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you don't hearken unto me, but you decide you're just going to walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you. And then he says, and I will chastise you seven times for your sins. That's a scary place to be right there, right. where the God of the universe says, I'm going to punish you seven times for the sins that you commit. I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter number 99. We're going to work our way back to the New Testament. We just have a few more passages we're going to look at. Go to Psalm chapter number 99 now. Psalm chapter number 99. When you commit a sin, God can give you forgiveness for that, that, that particular sin, but he will still punish you. I want you to look in Psalm chapter number 99. I'm not speaking of forgiveness as far as going to heaven. He will give you forgiveness at that particular time. Look at Psalm chapter number 99, verse number 7. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. Speaking of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord, our God. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though you tookest vengeance of their, inven their inventions. I want you to notice what it said there. That God forgave them, but he still took his vengeance upon them because of their inventions. Talking about the punishments that he gave, I'll give you a perfect example of God actually saying that I'm going to forgive you. I forgive you. I'm not going to hold this against you going forward, but I'm still going to punish you for this. And it's David and his sin against Bathsheba. I don't know if you remember the story proper, uh, well or not. We're not going to turn there. But when David committed the act of adultery with Bathsheba and he killed Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, God sent Nathan unto him. And he actually said, after David repented and asked for forgiveness, did Nathan respond and said, the Lord hath put away thy sin. But what ended up happening still? His sin was put away, of course. But what happened? He 
he still punished him. So here's the thing. You can sin against God. And you have to ask for forgiveness. You, of course, have to ask for forgiveness to make that relationship right. That's what the Bible teaches. You have to ask for forgiveness to fix a wrongdoing. You must ask for forgiveness. Even if you do something wrong against someone else, you have to ask for forgiveness. So if you do something wrong, you need to ask for forgiveness from God. You need to ask Him to forgive you. But here's the thing. God may forgive you, but that does not mean that you're not going to get punished. And you know what you need to do? You need to, you know, take it on the chin. You need to just take your punishment and take the responsibility for it. Like we talked about in Genesis 3 in our last uh, Bible study. You need to just take responsibility for what you have done. And just after you've already committed the act, like I said just a moment ago, just admit what you've done wrong, repent, move forward, and then just be happy that you're a child of God and that you're being punished. That's the best thing that you can do. Think about that. I mean, it's, you've already done, it's already too late. It's not right, it's wrong, but I'm saying after it's already committed, there's nothing you can do about it, just, just at least say, well, at least I'm saved. And going forward, I'm going to do all that I can do to please God. I'm going to do all that I can do to, you know, make God pleased and happy with me. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. We'll see a major parallel here in 1 Corinthians 11 with 1 Peter chapter number 4. With 1 Peter 4, speaking of there being a judgment for the saved and then a distinct or different judgment for the unsaved. There being one condemnation for Christians and another condemnation for the world. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. He's speaking about them abusing communion. Look at verse uh, 28, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. A lot of times when people see the word damnation, they think that just means hell. No, it does not. Keep reading. I'll show you. Damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. <clears throat> so they're, <clears throat> they're weak and they're sickly. And then he says this, and many sleep. That means that there are many dead because of this. That God has killed many because of this. There was, they brought damnation upon them, not the damnation of hell, but the damnation of this life. Look at what it says in verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Does all this seem, sound familiar with everything we've read thus far? 1 Peter 4, and then of course Hebrews 12. It says we are chastened of the Lord. That's because we are children. We are children of God. That, that, so the whole reason we're chasing of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. God punishes us in this life to make things right as well. That's the last point. God punishes us in this life so that he can settle the score for the things that we've done in the flesh. We're judged according to men in the flesh, just like those I referenced a minute ago in Noah's flood, right? And so that when we die, we, we go to heaven. So he punishes us immediately now. The time has come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. I want you to notice that there's a different condemnation. That we should not be condemned with the world. We're not condemned with the world. We have a different condemnation than the, than the world has. If the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the end be of them that believe not the gospel of God? Two different condemnations. Two different punishments. God's will would be that these people over here that don't obey the gospel of God, that they would obey the gospel of God. And they would be over here. That's what God's will is. That's what God would wish would happen. But it's just not the case. God isn't going to force people to believe on the Lord. He's not going to make them believe, you know, the gospel. Look at verse number 33. We'll read 33, and then uh, there's something I'm going to look at 34. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together, and he says, unto condemnation. Notice that they would be condemned. What would be their condemnation? This is one of the very last points that I want to make. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 3. Condemnation would be not hell. It would be weak, sickly, or death. These are different things that God would bring upon you. There are example after example of people being punished that were Christians in the Bible. Example after example. Saul being a prime example of a man that was saved. Samuel the prophet, as we read earlier today, told him that him and his sons would die and they would be with him. No one would debate or argue that Samuel was not in heaven. You can prove that that is Samuel himself. And that's when people try to say, oh, it's not Samuel, because they're trying to defend that Saul was not saved. They're trying to, to, to 
prove that Saul was not saved. It was Samuel, you know, in the verse. And Samuel said unto Saul. Saul was Saul the verse, Samuel, Samuel. Therefore, when, what Samuel said when he was speaking unto Saul, this is Samuel. He says, you're going to be with me. He's saying you're going to be where I am. We, of course, all know that Samuel is in heaven. So Saul, even after he lived this rebellious life, he's going, he's going and literally consulting with a woman that is conjuring up devils. I mean, this is extreme. She, he's trying to kill a man after God's own heart. He's going around trying to kill the anointed, the next man who would be the anointed of the Lord. He's just disobedient one time after another. He, you know, he sacrifices the animal when he knows he's not supposed to do that. He repeatedly just disobeys God. But you know what? He still went to heaven when he died. Because God settled the score in this life. And if Saul wasn't going to kill himself, God was going to kill him. He killed himself before God had that army get to him. That's what was going on. They were about to die, and Saul went ahead and did the job himself. You know why? Because he knew, God's not answering me anymore. God won't answer me. That's why he went to the woman with the familiar spirits in the first place. God had, had, had ceased from answering him through prayer. It ceased from speaking to him because he was a rebellion. What a scary place to be even as a Christian. So Revelation chapter number 3 is one of the last places I want to, uh, this is the last place I want to look at. Revelation chapter number 3, <clears throat> verse number 14. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That's the, this is the word of God speaking, that's why it says that. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Who are those that he chastens? His children. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It says that he chastens every son. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So if you are being chastised of God, that means you're a son of God. Notice also he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Because he chastens his children. He chastens those that are saved. Now I want you to look at the next verse. Be zealous therefore and repent. So you know what you should do if you've sinned against God? You know what you should do if you break one of God's commandments? Or you're walking contrary to God? You should repent. You should stop walking contrary to God. And you should be zealous and repent. So the things we can walk away from this with... Or you should be happy when you are corrected. I'm going to read lastly to you Job 5, 17. Listen to this. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Notice that. Happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. You should not despise the punishment or the chastisement that comes from God. You should be happy. If you remember the other time that this was quoted, I said I would tie that in together. The very next verse said, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. That's one of the other reasons why. You know why you should be happy? It's because you can learn and you can grow from it. You will be a partaker of his holiness. Later on afterwards, it, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Positive things come from it. Number one, be happy because you're saved. Be happy because you're a child of God. You know, another thing to be happy about is God has not given up on you. You're not in the state of, of you know, at least you're not in the state of Saul. Be happy about that. If God's just punishing you regularly in your life, at least you're not in the state of Saul. At least God's not killing you. At least, at least God's not saying, I'm just ending his life. He's useless and unprofitable to me at this point. I never want to get to that point. So be happy. If you're not there yet, then be happy that you're not. Be happy that God corrects you. Corrects you. Because God loves you. Not only that, you learn from 
correction, as we read a moment ago, that it yields the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness, and you can grow in wisdom. You can learn from the experience, and then you can teach it unto your children. Read about the correction that God brings upon us as the perfect father that he is, and then we can also apply that to our children, and we can be a good parent and guardian of the children that we have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we love you, dear Lord. We're thankful that you love us, that you correct us, that you don't just allow us to live the life of a um, and um, someone that's just out of control, dear Lord God. We're thankful that the beatings are meant to put us right on the right path, back on the right path, dear Lord God, and that we can learn from it, dear Heavenly Father. We're thankful that you love us and that, that, uh, that you don't just, uh, just treat us as though we are a master, that we don't have a father, but you love us and you care about us. Help us to learn from all of our mistakes, dear Lord God, and uh, we love you and just be with our church. Help us to grow. And I ask you that you would just give us the wisdom of what we need to do and help us to have the charity and the heart to care for people that we might uh, not just want to grow the church for any, any sort of wrong reason, but that we would grow our church so that we can help the city of Jacksonville. Get more people saved. Help that always to be our main focus. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.